Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Um, before we begin, can we open with a word of prayer? The dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have to study together. Even if it's not in person, we have this opportunity to share ideas through the Internet. And um, ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit um, to be here, to guide our minds and direct our discussion and study. Uh, we know that there's many things we have to sort out, and we just need your help to understand these things. We pray for each person study. We pray that you can be with them and help them in their day-to-day -day struggles. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so so welcome again to this morning's study. Now, now Stephen's here. Now, did you you watch the studies that we had uh, done? Yes. Or, was there anything you needed to point out that uh, that we have missed? Um, nothing comes to mind, no. So, so yesterday we were studying. Now Dwight's not here, so it'd be better if he was, but he's not. So we were studying that paper that he had put together uh, with the statements and spirit of prophecy. So it was um, February thirteenth, eighteen. Where is it here? Uh, February thirteenth, eighteen eighty-eight. That's it. Um, that she had said that she had written out um, a number of pages on Revelation 10. And, and we don't know what she wrote because there's no record of what she wrote, which is kind of interesting. Uh, because the whole thing about Revelation 10 is it uh, has the seven thunders in it, which are sealed up. And, you know, part of what we have come to understand is that these thunders are unsealed in the repeat of history. So we've been looking at these civil wars. And, of course, we're going to get back to Daniel chapter 11 at some point. But I, I do want to address what we had discussed a little bit yesterday. And that was these, this chart that I made back a number of years ago which was I was reminded of it because of Stephen's post on the unity, uh, you know, chat and WhatsApp. Um, so 16,560 days is 46 prophetic years. So it's interesting in 46 years, uh, the difference here has to do with the fact we're starting with February 15th, 1798, and going to October 22nd, 1844, right? So we're starting on a, um, like we're not going, it's not actually 46 years to the day. So it'd be 46 years plus how many ever days that would be. That would be um, 100 and... 54, then it counts in. Just trying to figure it out. I guess if I go uh, 63 plus 187, that's 100. Uh, so it's 46 years, and is that 100 and 150? 150 days? Does that make sense? Anybody understand what I, I'll just use the calendar convert and figure it out? Is this from the 15th of February? To October 20th. Yeah, to October 20th. So I'm just, you know, the number of days from February uh, 15th to October 22nd uh, should be. Um, yeah, so it's 17,050. Yes. And then in 46 years, you're going to have less than that. So I'm just trying to figure out the number of days difference. So. Be the 15th of February 1844. Yeah, so 250, 52 days difference. So that means from uh, February 15th to October 22nd in 1844, because it's a leap year. You know, so I guess it would be 
253, 253 days inclusive because of the leap year. Okay. That makes sense? So 253. So. Yeah, so. Um... Anyway, it's more than 46 years. It would have been nice if it was 252. But, but it, yeah, it's 46 years and 253 inclusive days. Let me see here, actually. I'm getting 250. Okay, how are you doing it? So we got, so we have to remember 1798. Um, there is uh, not going to be a leap year in uh, 1800, right? So anyway, so I got here. So I'm just going to do it this way. Okay, how are you doing it here? So. So I'm just using the date calculator. On so on from, the ca calendar on converter. That. It's not no, it's just an internet one. Okay. I'm in date. Yeah, so, so if it's, you go um, six sixteen hundred, sorry sixteen thousand eight hundred, from the fifteenth of February seventeen ninety eight to the fifteenth of February eighteen forty four. And then it's going to be another 250 days to the, uh, if I put in the 22nd of October, it's, it's going to put up uh, 17, okay. and 50. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's right. Um, I was do, trying to do it as a calculation that ended up messing it up. Okay. So. Well, actually, uh, yeah, actually, I think it might be 200. Well, yeah, so it's actually now giving me 16, it's like a different date, a number now. So it's like, just I'll add another one. Maybe, um, so it's 16,801. If you're just putting in the, the actual date, it's the 15th to the 15th, so. Yeah, well, when I use the calendar converter, it gives me 16,800. Um, but but that's that's a cardinal count. In the date converter, it does an it does an inclusive count, right? It'll you can have it so that it, it includes the all of the last date. So then yeah, it must have been it must have been a glitch here. Yeah, yeah, so yeah 16,800. 16, yeah, to the fifteenth, to so February fifteenth, and then you count two hundred and fifty. I mean, you, you could get 252 there if you counted, uh, uh, you know, to the end of October 22nd, you would get 251, I guess. And then that'd be 251. So we don't get 252. It just would have been nice if it was. <laughs> it would mm -hmm. fit in with what we've been doing with these um, calculations, right? Um now, of course, we, we could look at the biblical year. So if you look at the biblical date in 1798, February 15th is the 28th of Shabbat. And then if you go into uh, 1844, you'd actually have to go to February uh, 17th to get the 20, 28th of Shabbat. So that would give you actually... Um, more, right? So there'd be 16,802, which would give you less between October 22. So that would be 248. So 248. So whatever, we can't make it 252, but that's, that's all I was just curious about because I was kind of doing it in my head and I thought it's pretty close to 252. But the point is here, just getting back to this idea is that we have these spans of time the time that we're connecting to the flood and a prophetic period, 490 days representing the 70 weeks. And then to August 11th, the 1533 times 10 with 187 days. So, so these are interesting symbols of how these occur dealing with Islam. And then of course, if we're dealing with October 22nd and we're dealing with the 490, um, the 490 is going to give us the start of the 2300 days, right? So it's going to match up to the end. And then, of course, the 1533 
we've already dealt with so many times, this wonderful manifestation of the power of God, um, which ties to the Exodus in 1533 BC. Now, the question that I have and that we're, we're exploring here has to do with, um, how do we, how do we connect all of these symbols with these civil wars? So first we have the civil wars and, and the question is why are civil wars being marked? Right. Cause that was the question we were supposed to answer yesterday from Sunday study, um, to try to understand why these civil wars are being used as a symbol. Now, one is, when is the first civil war? What, as in heaven? Yeah, so it's in heaven, right? Great controversy. So we have a civil war that occurs in heaven. And the true king of the north is actually God. Right. Christ is the true king of the north. He, he sits in the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. And so obviously his adversary is in a symbolic way is the king of the south. And, and the king of the south, he's going to come and try to usurp Christ's throne. Right. He's going to sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Right. According to. Um, I think that one's. I always get mixed up. I think that's Isaiah 14. Is that the one where he sits on the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north? Yeah. Um, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. So that's Christ's throne. And, And in the sides of the north, in the sanctuary, on the north side of the sanctuary, is the table of showbread. And in Revelation chapter 4, we're going to see this one seated upon a throne with a rainbow above his head. Ellen White's going to clearly show that that's Christ, not the Father who's seated upon the throne, um, that John sees in vision in Revelation chapter 4, because Christ is going to point to the rainbow above his own head. And, um, And then the one seated upon the throne, he can't unseal this book that's sealed with seven seals, right? It's going to be this lamb that's slain that has seven horns and seven eyes, right? The lamb as it had been slain, right? So that's the one that can unseal this book. So Christ seated upon the throne can't unseal the book that's sealed with seven seals. Only Christ as a sacrifice can unseal, and right? And that, of course, is pointing to the sanctuary service because the book of Revelation is all about the sanctuary service. All of the symbols are there. You have, you know, of course, it starts with the lampstand. And then in chapter four, he sees Christ's throne, which is before the lampstand. That must be, of course, the table of showbread. Uh, he's going to see the altar of incense. He's going to see the brazen altar. He's going to see the Ark of the Covenant, right? All of those things are going to be seen by John through the book of Revelation. Getting back to this idea, then, is that we have this great controversy, and this great controversy is regarding um, the king of the north, and we'll just say the king of the south. Now, Satan seeks to be the king of the north, right? He's going to sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. We know that Satan usurps Christ's throne. Uh, In 1844... When Christ moves from the holy to the most holy, where is Satan symbolically? Not not literally, but symbolically, where is Satan? Where is he seen? Where does mm-hmm. everyone? Yeah, so he's breathing on those who are still worshiping or looking to worship Christ in the holy place. And right, the holy place. Yeah. So we don't think that Satan is literally in the holy place, but symbolically he is, right? So he's there. People are looking for that stage or whatever you want to call it progression of of god's um salvation the everlasting covenant and they're not moving beyond the holy place to the most holy they don't understand that we're in the time of the day of atonement so one of the things which relates more to our friday night studies we haven't really touched on is um 
we did touch on the fact that uh, those that have rejected the 1888 message who say they have accepted it, but have actually rejected it, just think that the 1888 message was a re-emphasis of the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith. Right. So that's all they think it is. Um, but of course, that's not the case. The message of righteousness by faith as presented by Jones and Wagner is really dependent upon an understanding of Christ's ministry in the most holy place. And, and that there is this final generation that will perfect a Christian character and stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. That is something that's unique pretty much to Adventism. So it can't just be a, re, a re-emphasis of the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith. So, so we know that the Protestants and, and those that have rejected Adventism who are in Adventism, they just, they're still in the holy place. They haven't moved to the most holy place. So this goes back to the question about these civil wars. So we have this civil war that began in heaven. Um, so we can say that these civil wars are typical of the great controversy. Would that be a wild stretch or is that, does that sound? It's fairly sound. Okay. So we need to always keep these types of things in mind. Sometimes we get really bogged down about the history and the chronology and all these details, but um, we can see that what's happening in the United States as this Protestant nation comes to represent something. And, and it's going to be involved in this great controversy, the Sunday law. That's what the third angel's message is about, is about this conflict between Sabbath and Sunday. So we have all of these civil wars. We have the civil wars that occurred within ancient Israel. We have the civil wars um, that occurred in American history. We have the civil wars that occurred in Greek history. And, and they're all telling us something about our time. And, and the big struggle that we have been having as Seventh-day Adventists and, and people in this movement, in knowing that we're in a movement, all Seventh-day Adventists who are believing in Adventism, believe there's a coming Sunday law, right? Now, there's more and more Adventists, you know, not thinking that that's anything important. You know, that's just some old-fashioned idea. It's never going to happen. But many Adventists are, you know, still believing that there's some kind of Sunday law coming, however they see that happening. And this movement knows that there's a Sunday law coming. coming. And part of this movement is looking for a Sunday law that is imminent. So they think that this Sunday law is going to come right away, like within the next year or two, that we're going to have this Sunday law. Now, it's true that some were even seeing the pandemic as the start of that, that it wasn't just a type of the Sunday law, um, that it was actually all going to be about, you know, this this vaccine and things like that, which, of course, we know that doesn't really make any sense as characteristics, right? But it's definitely not, not a Sunday law because it's not about Sunday. And, and the Sunday law has to be about Sunday. It has to be a religious Sunday law. It can't be a secular Sunday law. It can't be an environmental Sunday law. It can't be a health Sunday law. It can't be about some other issue. It has to be about Sunday. And, and, and in a direct way, not in some sort of, you know, oblique sense, right? It has to be direct. This is what they're doing because that's what's clear in the Bible and spirit of prophecy regarding the Sunday law. So, so we have a Sunday law that's coming. In that Sunday law, there is this conflict between the North and the South. And there isn't really, when it comes to this battle between the King of the North and the King of the South, people seem to want to sort of take sides, right? We, we've seen that in the movement. When we had, um, You know, Parminder and Tess, how, how are they seeing this, you know, Republican Democrat thing? Were, were they on the sides of the Republicans or the Democrats? 
come across. Okay. And then generally speaking, because we're conservatives, you know, we would be prone to support the Republicans, right? You know, for we, we would sort of be on the hat side, the conservative issues, whether we're not saying that we're voting or anything like that, if you were in Americans, but, but we would sympathize with, um, you know, anti-wokeism, for instance. Right? We would we'd definitely be on the side of, you know, free speech and all those types of things. So, <clears throat> so how does this war, this, this, this issue of the Sunday law, how does it play into all of these going back to the war in heaven, going back to what happened with ancient Israel, what happened with Greece? What is, what is the basic common denominator that, that helps us to understand uh, the issues? Because, you know, we're not on the side of Republicans or Democrats. So, you know, how does that how does that even fit in with this great controversy? I know it's a really broad question, but I framed it so that we should be able to think about it. Well, our kingdom's not of this world. We should be observers okay. of what's going on in the world and looking for history and prophecy to agree. Okay. So... To Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, just to interpret events aright according to scripture and the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. And we all understand, though, that we people are going to have sympathies in this whole issue. Right? Now, some, and, and I find it very odd because there are people who ideologically they're, they're, they would be aligned with Trump and they believe that Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law. Right. So in their thinking, they actually like Trump, but they believe that Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law. Now, what does that tell us about our thinking? That it's fairly myopic. <laughs> OK, yeah, it's nearsighted. Right. Yeah, it, it, it really puzzles me. Now, there are some who really like Trump and don't believe that Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law. Right. That is. They think, and not necessarily many people in this movement, but people, Adventists, who they support Trump, right? They believe a Sunday law is coming, but we know that based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, it's going to come from the right, right? We don't think that a Sunday law is going to come from Democrats and the globalists. I mean, it's going to be the United States, and the United States as a Republican government is going to bring in a Sunday law. That's what we generally believe, right? But people will will think, well, Trump is a good Republican or something. So they'll just say, yeah, we, we like Trump. You know, he's, he's going to hold off a Sunday law. So we have that type of thinking. Now, of course, we have the thinking where the Sunday law is going to come from uh, the left. There are people who think that. And, and I've, I've wondered about it, too, just because... You know, the globalists are seeming to take over. And so I looked at that. And that would be when we're worried about, like, the World Economic Forum. Right? So if you really think that the enemy is the World Economic Forum, not the papacy or the United States, then you would say, well, that's that's who we need to fear. All the thing, the things that the World Economic Forum are planning, that's what we're fearing, because that's, that's going to lead to the Sunday but we know that the Sunday law comes from the United States. It doesn't come from Europe, right? And there's there's lots we don't know about the Sunday law. Even though we, we have things that we are told, there's a lot of detail left out. And so that leaves a lot of room for speculative theories regarding the Sunday law. But if we're going to take this issue of the king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11, and we're going to look at this from the context of Greece, what we were looking at is we were looking at the fact that um, Rome establishes the vision. Now, Rome is going to become the king of the north, but Rome is neither the king of the north nor the king of the south initially, right? Because this is about Greece, not about Rome. 
So how do we address Rome coming in in this battle in Greece? So this is going to be, um, yeah. So in verse 20, right? Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes uh, in the glory of his kingdom. Uh, let me see. Where do we go back? That's um, not there. I always forget where it is. Oh, yeah. That's going to be all the history of Rome there. So it's going to be verse 14. So the verse 14, this is all going to be about Rome, right? You're going to have pagan Rome. You're going to get to, uh, and, and we haven't addressed this. So this is what we have to do now is we're going to have to address this transition from, from Greece to pagan Rome and the interpretation of Daniel chapter 11. So we are looking at the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they fall. So, um, Stephen, do you have thoughts on this? Because I know you've been studying Daniel chapter 11. So you still take the position that this is uh, Rome, right? That exalts itself to establish the vision? Yes. Okay. Now, so it says in those times, there shall be many stand up against the king of the south. How do you understand that historically? No, um, yeah. yeah, so that uh, would include Antiochus III and his brother. And uh, I think there's, I can't remember, there's some, some in that history where others are involved. Maybe they, they get some mercenaries. Um, I can't remember exactly. I think I've, I was just going sort of going by what Swearingen was saying, I think, his interpretation. Okay. Okay, so... Um... So you got all these people coming against the king of the north, or, or against the king of the south, pardon me, right? So you're going to have the people from the king of the north, but it says many shall stand up. Now, now why does it say many? Is it because of these different uh, groups? Is that what you're saying? So that we got, I can't remember the names of all the people. I'm trying to find it here. Um, Antiochus Magnus. So people in Egypt, those provinces. Okay. That's what I have. Um, Philip of Macedon. Philip of Macedon. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Philip of Math, Math, Macedon. Right. Okay. So they come against the king of the south. And the idea is that Rome, uh, it, it doesn't want to see them conquer Egypt, right? That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So that's why, that's why the robbers of thy people exalt themselves to establish the vision. They they rise up. They they uh, and here the word exalt. So I'm trying to remember back here. Exalt themselves. Nasa that is to lift, um, figuratively, absolutely, relatively. Advance or rise. So, so arise is probably a better way of translating it rather than exalt. But they arise themselves. That's why they put exalt. Is they arise, you know, the idea is they're rising themselves. So that's why they have exalt themselves. But to establish the vision. Now that word establish is the word that's normally, uh, uh, translated as to stand, amad. Right. So all through this here, they're going to talk about uh, people standing. Right. Um, so in the dictionary, if we look at this and you see in uh, this word is translated different ways. You know, it's translated in the past tense stood or it could be a present tense stood and stood and, and stand it, you wouldn't say. OK, so that's going to be in Daniel 11. One, you're going to see that word you're going to see stand in daniel uh 10 11 11 2 and 4 three times um verse 6 and 7 twice uh, verse 14 verse 16 and 17 three times verse 20 to 21 twice it's in 11 25 and it's 11 31 and it's in daniel 12 1 right so that word stand they're using to establish 
They're, they're translating in the King James as to establish the vision. So now, of course, it would be odd if you're going to say they arise to stand the vision. So, and that's going to be the the the, the mare, no, the kazone. Pardon me, it's the kazone two three seven seven the kazone. But they shall fall, right? Um, totter or waver, and and here it's like the legs, especially the ankle, right? So, what does that remind us of here? The feet. Okay. Now, so the question is. When it says, but they shall fall, the question is, is that those that stand up against the king of the south? Or is it that the robbers of thy people that exalt themselves to establish the vision, they fall? Right? So we had this discussion before, but we're just going through this again. And I tentatively, hesitantly, I don't know. I've taken the position that it's probably referring ultimately to Rome at the end. Right. Because of the fact that it's referring to uh, the ankles or the feet, the stumbling. Right. And that would fit in with the in image of Daniel chapter two. Does that makes sense. Yeah, I tend to go with what you're saying. And uh, what Uriah Smith writes in this verse. Yeah, because he says it would refer ultimate. Well, he has the choice. It could either refer to their ultimate end of Rome or to those coming against the king of the south. But but I think it makes sense to apply that to, to Rome as falling and, and just its ultimate end. And especially since um, now we say this is to establish the vision, the kazone, right? Now the kazone has, uh, that is the, that is the vision that goes all the way to to 1798 at least, right? Because you can look at it as the 21260s. And and Rome is going to fall in both cases, right? It's going to fall near the end of the first 1260. And then it's going to fall uh, towards the end of the second 1260. Both the daily and papalism have a fall. But ultimately, the fall is, you know, the second coming of Christ, um, because the papacy is going to rise up again. Okay. So is this all making sense to people? Just this quick review on this verse. So this all makes the most sense that this is Rome that that rises up to establish or stabilize or stand. Right? You can see the word, you know, in their stable to, to stand. Um, the vision and the vision being the kazone, but in the end they're going to fall, right? So then we have, um, so the king of the north shall cap come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him but he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So how have we understood verses 15 and 16? Stephen, if you can give us a summary of these verses. Yeah, so the, the king, uh, king of the north, on the August the third, shall come, <laughs> shall, shall invade whole Syria, 2001 to 198 BC, and defeat yeah. Egypt at and cast up a mount, besiege Egypt's army in Sidon, and take the most fenced cities in the arms of the south shall not withstand. Uh, the Egyptian army shall surrender to Antiochus's forces, neither mm -hmm. his chosen people, the general Scopus, and um, his army from Aetolia, an area of Greece northwest of Athens. Neither shall there be any strength to withstand. The Egypt's army shall surrender. Never to wield power henceforth against the Jewish Empire. And then verse 16. Mm -hmm. But he, but he, pagan Rome, that come against him, uh, that came against Antiochus III, uh, shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. So Rome 
becomes a dominating power over the Seleucid Empire in other areas, eventually conquering Syria in 65 BC and taking the mantle of the king of the north. And he, Pompey, a Roman general and statesman, shall stand in the glorious land by which his hands shall be consumed. He shall conquer and subdue Judea in 63 BC. Okay, so that's a really good summary. You just did that off the top of your head? I know, I was reading my notes. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so so we all understand this now, right? So this is about uh, the Battle of Paneum and then Rome coming in following that. And it's then going to um, take over as the king of the north, right? So now we know that uh, Swearingen, he's going to try to put Antiochus Epiphanes in this history, but but we reject that, you know, um, you know, in the way that he looks at this history. So so we've taken the position, which is basically the position that Adventists had taken in the past of how to understand uh, these verses. Now, I just want to touch on some of the the chronology stuff here. So uh, in Daniel 11, verse 14, now we had looked at Daniel 11, 11. In Daniel 11, 11, we had counted up the lexical numbers of this verse. And it was, when I didn't include this last word, it was actually 187 years and... uh, 20, 20 days, I believe. Um, so it was um, 67,340, I think is what it was, if I remember correctly. Um, but when I included that that last one, as a, and it's just had to do with the mistake that I made. But the thing is, the last one, the word, last word in the verse, is a symbol of March 27th. So... So it gives us that um, symbolism of July 18th and March 27th. Now, Daniel 11, verse 14, uh, its lexical number is 67,975. Now, if we remember that 67,920 is... Uh, the number of days from the first day of the first month in 1844 uh, to the first day of the first month in uh, 2030, right? So 67,920, uh, and it's 2,300 months, right? So we're going to have that as 2,300 months. But this is going to be uh, 67,000. 975. So it's going to be 55 days. If we took it as days, right? It would be 65 or 55 days past, um, April 5th, 2030. If we're going to start, um, you know, on the first day of the first month in 1844, right? So if I go to April, here, I'll just show you what I'm doing here. So go to 1844. This is the calendar converter. It's the first day of the first month, right? If I count uh, 67,920, it's going to be bring me to the end of April 4th. So I'm counting this inclusively or whatever. Bring me, I guess it's exclusively. It's going to bring me to the end of April 4th. But you can see to go to the first day of the first month is the next day. So that's going to be 186 years or 2,300 months from April 19th, 1844, right? And so um, so I'm just going to go back here, and then I'm going to add the 55 days. So that's the difference. Now, this brings me to the 25th day of the second month, which is, of course, a symbol of 252, the 2520, right? Um so it just get, brings, gives me this symbol. And then also the Mayan date has 17128, has all the numbers of July 18, 2020 in it. 
Um, and then it gives us, you know, May 29th, which as far as I can tell, it doesn't give us anything, but, um, that would be the, um, the, the, the date on our calendar. In the Islamic calendar, it's going to be 126, the 26th day of the first month, a symbol of half of 252. So it's kind of interesting. Um, let me have this here, the 126 and the 252. If you understand what I mean, like the 1260 being half of 2520. So what does that tell us? So we go through something like that. We look at a lexical number of a verse that we, we've looked at a lot of the symbolic numbers in Daniel chapter 11. Um, and so, you know, I check these things out. I say, does this have any significance? And what would that mean regarding um, this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, and the robbers of thy people exalting themselves to establish the vision. Because if we're connecting it with our history, what is it that we're saying about this verse in applying it to our time, right? So this isn't the main application of this verse. This is just applying it to our time. Well, as we were addressing a bit on Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, 11, 14, there's the robbers of thy people or the alternate reading, the children of the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves. So our literal situation is very much secondary to the prophetic situation. Because we're looking at some, we're looking at a group that's going to look to establish the big picture, the calzone to establish the seven times. But they will fall. They will not be successful. Can you be more clear exactly what you're saying, what you're thinking this means then? Because, because we have the symbol that attaches to, to 2030, right? So it's just 55 more than, than 2300 months. Understood. But aren't we looking at in this in this entire situation, aren't we looking at this to understand how this group, whether we see it as the robbers of thy people or the children of the robbers of thy people, are going to look to bring forward what is going to bring this curse. I mean, so many have taken the literal application that it has to be a political party that does it. We have said in the past it is Rome, but what if this is the descendants of Rome that are bringing this forward? Okay. Well, I know you, you have this emphasis upon the children there. Right, so the sons literally, um, because it's going to be Ben, which is sons. Um, and uh, the idea here, you know, obviously it can refer to a son, but in the widest sense of literal or figurative relationship, including grandson, subject, nation, quality, or condition. Um, and it can refer to, um, you know, a bough, a branch, a breed. You know, so it's basically a descendant of some sort. And now the King James tra translation doesn't have the word mentioned at all. It just says also the robbers of thy people. Or, um, and in, in Young's literal translation, it's going to say the sons of the destroyers of thy people to lift themselves up to establish the vision. And they've stumbled. We got um, another literal translations. In those times, many shall stand up against the king of the south, and the sons of the violent ones of your people shall rise up to establish the vision. They shall stumble. Right. So you got um, the sons of the violent ones in that translation. Um, and I'm not really sure if I if I like any of these translations 
but like I don't think they give a sense of what it's talking about um, in the sense that so when we're dealing with Rome, right? So we're gonna we, we know that it's Rome that rises up to establish the vision. The question is why is it called this? Why is it you know the sons of the breakers that rise up? Or the violent ones or the destroyers. Why is it describing? Yep, yeah, Stephen? Yeah, to me, that reminds me of uh, the base of Revelation, right? Uh, Daniel chapter 7, the terrible beast. The people okay. Are right. So, so it, it, it's referring to, bro, to the, like the, um, where is it here? Right, the fourth beast, frightening and terrifying, very strong. And to it were great iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and stamped that was left with its feet. But it was different from all the beasts before it, and it had ten horns. Right. So we have this this beast with ten horns. And we studied a lot into the ten horns already. Um, but it devours and crushes and stamps, right? With it and so it has iron teeth. And it stamps um, the residue or what is left. I'm not looking here at the King James and looking at another translation. So, but it's going to be the residue, the remnant, right? The idea there is right. So when you look at this word residue, um, it's a cor- it's Chalde, right? So it's Aramaic. It's not in Hebrew. Um, it says it co- corresponds to 7605, it's 7606 itself. Uh, Sha'ir, Sha'ar, and it's, it's translated as the remainder. Um, but it's also related to the remnant, right? So 7605 is the word in, uh, in Hebrew that means the remnant. So when it talks about the remnant, that's who's going to be trampled underfoot and it's going to be uh, crushed okay in in this context here the remnant the question why why is it stamping the the remnant well that's because this fourth beast contains both pagan and papal Rome right so it it's it's going to be there at the end as well okay um that kind of what you're referring to there, Stephen? Yes. I mean, we are going to have where it's going to, um, where it talks about the horns and the little horn and all that stuff, that it's going to wear out the saints of the Most High, I think, to change times and laws, right? Um, for time, times, and a dividing of time. So we, we take that as being... Uh, Papal Rome, of course. So we have, um, Papal Rome, uh, uh, or pardon me, Pagan Rome here typifying what's going to happen with Papal Rome. So they exalt themselves to establish the vision. Now, where did Jeff place this in our history? Because Rome comes into play. But they they come early. That's the way I, I sort of understood that he said that. Because the papacy is going to be there at the end, right? But it comes early with what happened in the league with Reagan, right? Correct. Okay. And so you can see that Rome is involved here in this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. And the king of the south is going to be conquered in this history. And the same thing happens in 1989. So, so we can see the parallel there, um, with what happens. The king of the north here representing then as a type of what's going to happen with the United States combined with the papacy, uh, to overthrow the Soviet Union. Right. We can agree on that. That's how that's how Jeff saw it. 
in just a nutshell. And so we're going to have all of these these standings, right? So we're going to have uh, now it's going to exalt itself, and the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves. So we're saying that this is um, there's something more to hear than than um, and just saying it's the sons of the breakers of thy people that exalt themselves. So we're, we're connecting it to really the papacy, even though this is talking about Rome initially. And, and here it's Rome, pagan and papal Rome are in a sense tied together in this history. Right? I mean, it's obviously this is going to be in the time of pagan Rome. But we know that pagan and papal Rome are really one. They're Rome. Like we don't say there's Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and then something else that isn't Rome, because we call it Rome. We call it Papal Rome. Right? We have Pagan Rome and Papal Rome. There's still Rome. So Rome goes all the way to the end. Obviously, we have the 70 years, the days of one king, representing the time of the United States. Uh, and we have, of course, uh, the UN, the Dragon Power. That's going to come to play there. So they all come together at the end to be this threefold union. So a lot of this that we're studying here, dealing with Greece and then the rise of the papacy or Rome, relates to what we studied when we were looking at Medo Persia. It's, it's really covering the same history, just different nations. Okay, you got a comment there, Dwight? No, just okay. listening. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so the sons of the destroyers of thy people rise to stand the vision or to set up the vision. Like this word established is the word stand, but they shall fall. So this vision, of course, is the kazon. It's going to go all the way to the end. Um, so you're, you're saying, Dwight, you're trying to focus upon the sons of the robbers, that these are the descendants. These are the descendants. These are those that are finding themselves in agreement with the tenants of Rome. Okay. But initially here, it's not talking about them. This is talking about pagan Rome. Agreed. So as far as applying it initially, why is it the sons of the destroyers of thy people? Why do they use the word sons there? I keep thinking that because Rome has had its time, that it has to wait for its children to come on the world stage, not unlike, you know, as let's say David waited for Solomon to be able to come on the the stage in the throne of Israel. Now, what about um, Romulus and Remus as far as Rome? Could that have anything to do with the reason why they talk about the sons? Okay, but Romulus and Remus were supposed to be twins. So yeah. they're supposed to be equals. Mm -hmm. Are the children of a king or the children, the successors of a nation, always the equal of that nation? Mm, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really sure I understand the question. Okay. Let's, if, if we're looking at the 1843 chart and the 1850 chart, how is Rome first depicted? Is it not uh, male? Then uh, the only kingdom which changes from male to okay. female. Well, what, what my thought, my question was, when we're looking at the 1843 or the 1850 chart, isn't Rome first depicted as legs of iron? Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so it's the legs of iron. Okay, and now... This continues not strictly in iron, but the feet 
are partially of iron and partially of miry clay, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is Rome, as it is depicted in the feet, as strong as the legs of iron? Well, no, the feet are not as strong as the legs. Okay. Now, looking at this on a symbolic premise, Rome initially was of iron. And we're talking about both Rome papal and Rome pagan. But when they've had to make alliances, when they've had to enter into the leagues, have they been as strong as they were formerly? No. So when, when we consider this, if we step, if we're stepping back to look at what what you were bringing up to begin with, and what was being addressed in the chat, yes, mm -hmm. Romulus and Remus were the founders of Rome, but Romulus and Remus were founding a pagan nation, one that became focused on dominating their world. Was Rome? pagan successful in world domination mm -hmm. was Rome papal successful in world domination yep has Rome in its form with the leagues of those around them been as successful in their domination of the world. Now here, I would have to say they haven't because you still have Islam and others that are standing where the, they are not in agreement with what Rome is doing. Mrs. White has made other comments that Rome will be surprised at how the Protestants begin to take charge in leading the world to the worship of, on Sundays. So we know that Rome is operating in the shadows. We know that they're operating behind the scenes, but are they going to be the ones that are going to come out to the forefront? Well, not till later. Okay. Because initially it's just going to be uh, the United States. Yeah, I'm not sure how that's going to happen. I've wondered about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure this out. So, see, the thing is, who are the breakers of the people? I mean, it's not going to be the descendants, right? It's going to be Rome itself. I'm still puzzled why they have the word sons there, I guess, because it doesn't make sense that the children of the robbers, unless the robbers of thy people or the breakers of thy people are earlier, because the question is, when did they break God's people, you know, if we're going to attach that to 1260 years from 538 to 1798, um, ultimately, well, it wouldn't be the children of the robbers of thy people that exalt themselves to, it'd be the fathers of the robbers of thy people that exalt themselves to establish the vision. And so I take it here more in the sense of the founders this is this has to do with the origins of Rome. That's the way I try to understand it with the word sons. But it's just referring to its origin. I don't know if that makes sense, but because that's that's the type of um like a builder of the family name, 
right? That's what it, that's the first definition uh, given for the word Ben, a son, a builder of the family name. So to me, this would, as per the chat uh, comment regarding uh, Roman, Romulus and Remus were actually founders of Rome. So I think it refers more to the foundation of Rome, that it's at the foundation of Rome that they exalt themselves to establish the vision. It's, it's in that history, the early history of Rome. And then it lead, brings us to the end of the history of Rome, saying, but they shall fall. And and this idea of establish, which means to stand, um, would would fit in the idea of, because even though it says to establish the vision, um, they rise to establish the vision. Well, that vision is going to address pagan, you know, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, but, but it's also going to, you know, cover that whole period, pagan and papal, the daily and the abomination of desolation. Desolation. I don't know. Sometimes I just get really bothered by something and I have to, to figure it out. But I think it makes more sense just to refer to the foundation of Rome rather than, um, you know, the children of Rome. Because it's going to be Rome all the way through here. It's not after Rome is gone. Rome is the final vision or, or the final um, kingdom. And it's going to fall at the end, but it does fall in different ways. Pagan Rome falls, paper Rome falls, and modern Rome, Rome is going to fall. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? The beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, right? Well, we have the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, yeah. Okay. Now, the dragon is the adversary, right? Yeah. The beast, because it has seven heads and ten horns, is giving us a symbol of something that has, with the seven heads, a perfect corruptness. Okay. But is this the, a singular situation? I'm, I, I guess I'm just, I know I'm being odd about it, but I'm still seeing a progression of this with Rome and with spiritualism. So, mm -hmm. I mean, okay, I'm, so I'm trying yeah. to think of other ways to pre present this. Yeah, I don't don't have a good answer. I just think it makes the most sense to, that this is the beginning of Rome, where it exalts itself. Right? It's not right at the very foundation of Rome. But one of the things we talked about before was, you know, the seven heads and the ten horns. And the seven heads would definitely refer to the seven um, mountains of Rome, the seven hills upon which the woman sitteth. So the Rome is famous for this seven, the seven hills or the seven mountains. Um and if you deal with Romulan, Romulus and Remus, you know, the symbols there, of course, is that they're going to be establishing these hills, right? So the, so this is about the beginning of Rome that we have these events. I mean, we have to say that this is at the beginning because Rome's going to last for a long, long time. So when they exalt themselves or they rise up, that would be a kingdom rising up. Now, they do this to establish the vision. Right, as we have it in the King James. But they're setting up or standing up the vision. And the question is, why is Rome doing that? Because it's not just that they exalt themselves and it happens to establish the vision, that they're doing this to establish the vision. So what is Rome doing in Daniel 11 verse 14? Because this is the end of end of Greece, right? And Rome comes in. Yes, that's the time that uh, Rome is coming to partner with uh, Macedonia. Yeah. Yes, when uh, they're coming into a league, when 
the king of the south will attack they, they are coming in so that uh, they, will, they will partner so that they will defend each other if the this the other side is being attacked this this other one has to come in right and so that's why by rome is one is they don't want the king of the south to be completely and these other nations end up taking over the whole territory they, they want them weaker right so but still the question the question that, that i'm asking is they exalt themselves to establish the vision and if we take this in its sort of direct sense the reason that rome is exalting itself or rising it up up is for the purpose of establishing the vision that is rome is doing that for this purpose does, does that make sense to people not just that rome rises up and it it helps to establish the vision or it causes the vision to be established I, i'm saying is there intent on the part of rome to establish the vision that is they may not i'm not saying that they are understanding the prophecy but they're doing this for the purpose of establishing the vision, the kazone, right? And, and the question is, why would they do that? Like, what does it mean that they're doing that from their perspective? I don't know if that makes sense to people or not. What was the purpose as we have looked at this in the past? Mm -hmm. When the kazone the broad picture vision. Mm -hmm. What was the purpose under the daily and under the transgression which maketh desolate? What were they doing to the people of God? Well, they're persecuting God's people. Are they not trampling them down? Well, they're first scattering and then trampling. Okay. Right. Now, so, okay, go on. At the end, are the people of God going to remain scattered? Um, well, there's always going to be a remnant that's gathered in. No, but, that's not, not what I'm asking. Yeah, okay. Are they going to remain scattered? Well, are, yes. Are the remain. People, so the people of God are going to remain scattered? Well, if you're taking it in the sense of the people, the scattering of the power of the holy people, that's going to be literal Israel. They're going to continue to be scattered. Now, if you're talking about the remnant of the people of God at the end, then they're not going to be scattered because those are going to be the true people of God. But God's people had been scattered. You know, the Israelites were scattered and they're still scattered. Even though you can say, well, they're all gathered in Israel. No, that's only just some of them, right? The ten tribes are lost. They're, they're scattered, never to be gathered. Okay, but at, at the very end, when we're coming to the point where the message is going forward. Hmm. When the message of Revelation 14 is going forward, are the people of God remaining scattered at that time? No, God's people will be gathered together at the end. So we we have that already in our understanding of the two twenty five twenties. So you yeah. have so you have um, Protestantism at the end of 1798. It's going to actually receive this message of the first angel's message. And, you know, some will accept that message. Most, of course, aren't. They're going to be tested by that. And then you're going to have um, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's going to represent the gathering of Judah, establishing of God's denominated people again. So there is a gathering there. There's two different groups, Protestants and the Adventists. And, of course, they're going to be they're separated, but the two sticks are going to be joined as per Stephen's study this last Sabbath, um, in connection with the Sunday law, right? So the Protestants, the true Protestants, are going to join with God's people to stand at the Sunday law. 
So, so it's only the true people of God at the end that are then gathered. Right? All through this history, they're scattered, they remain scattered, they're persecuted. Right? Right. Uh, I just yeah. wanted to, yeah. Uh, verse 14, the way it is uh, coming in, uh, it's different from these other verses because it's starting with, and in those times. And uh, I'm seeing like, uh, maybe this is the time that uh, Rome is trying to be introduced as the fourth kingdom. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Gabriel, yeah. Yes, by Gabriel. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, there's still something here, you know, I think that we're missing. But so now when it talks about in those times, right? So let's look at this this Hebrew. So we already looked at the word times. It, it's the word that uh, um, is translated as certain when they have certain years, right? After certain years, and and but here it's translated as times, and same as the end of. Um, verse 6 he strengthened her in these times right so it's sometimes uh, translated as times uh, sometimes as certain okay so um, so it says in those times now this this word here there's quite a bit of disagreement about it um, what it actually is referring to so here it just says they, these, the same, who. Um, and they say it comes from the word halak, which means to walk, which doesn't really make much sense, right? The related word is halak, 1981. This is 1980, 1992. Um, and um, it's just not a very common expression. So, and in those times, there's many stand up against so it's not normally how you would say it so even though they translated it into english this way it's not normally what you would see um you know we're running out of time here so i, I want to come back to this this expression here because every time we have this six two five six um we've seen that it's connected with the symbolic uh the symbol of prophetic time, because six times two times five times six is 360. Obviously, six times six is 36, two times five is 10, 10 times 36 is 360. And we've used it in other calculations. Now, if we add those to the, to the time, so those times we add it together, uh, we get 22 years, 212 days, something like that. Um, and I just want to explore this a little bit more when we look at this tomorrow. So um, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We ask for your continued guidance as we study your word. Help us in our personal study and the things that we do today. May your spirit remind us of these things. May we contemplate them. And may they strengthen us and encourage us. Please be with each person studying these truths. May your angels watch over them. And may we be able to encourage one another. Bring us together again according to thy will, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.